John, I want to get a, a sense of your background uh, before we, we talk about, you know, we get right into the meat and potatoes of, of what we're here to talk about. Um, so why don't you tell me where you're from, what your early years were like, what I know you worked in Boston Public Schools, so maybe what inspired you to cr uh, pursue that career path, things like that, details like that. Yeah, so, yeah, Jared, I started out about a mile from here in this location in, in Brighton. I went to local schools in elementary, and then I went to high school in downtown. In those days, uh, the downtown high schools were very attractive to people who lived in what we called the districts. We had two kinds of high schools, central and district. Uh, I became a, a teacher after college at graduate school, mainly because of the miserable experience I had in high school. I just didn't think schools had to be the, the way they were run. Mm -hmm. uh, recitation, memorization did not seem to be, and it was, for me, a very difficult time going to boring, boring classes. Mm. And I didn't know why we had to be antagonized. Uh, I became a high school teacher in one of the central uh, high schools. And um, after a few years, I was recruited to work at a place called the Educational Planning Center. And then I moved into administration after the desegregation order of 1974. And I remained there for uh, uh, seven or eight years. And eventually, after um, years of administration, I decided to go back to finish my career in the school system as a teacher. It's very interesting. So you, you got kind of a panoramic view of the Boston public school system through your career. Yes, especially at the planning center, <clears throat> because we were trying to change the way services were delivered and the way classroom instruction was run and especially the way schools were built. Uh, it was a great opportunity to know every street and alley in the city and to work in many different kinds of community groups. Uh, one of the motivations of the planning center was we were going to plan in the neighborhoods instead of planning in an isolated central building. Mm -hmm. um, what year did you start teaching? Uh, my first year was 1965. And what did schools in Boston look like in 1965? Uh, well, the physical structures, for the most part, were very old. I think there were only two or three buildings in the city that I can remember that could be considered new schools. There was mm -hmm. one in uh, Jamaica Plain and there was one in Columbia Point. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the buildings had been built in the WPA under Roosevelt, the Works Administration Project. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the cookie cutter schools where there would be standard brick structures with uh, a wing of rooms and a wing of rooms above that and a wing of rooms above that. Um, there were many schools that were built in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, all the issues that ultimately became known, asbestos, uh, ventilation, circulation, uh, gases, iodine, radon, all those kinds of things, were in my time became known. Of course, for a century they weren't known. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. for, for, and I can't tell you before the last century, I just knew 19th century buildings. But the school buildings were not in very good shape. Uh, uh, there was one in Brighton, it was a little wooden school with a cupola, a wooden cupola on it. <laughs> uh, it was a yellow building with a, a blue cupola. And I'm sure that building may have been Civil War vintage. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, so can't tell you what the safety issues were, could have been in that school, uh, egresses and those kinds of things. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, physically, materially, and also 
as far as you know, lesson planning, the content students were getting. It, it, was a, it was a school system that m maybe needed <laughs> modernization or was, or was hungry for modernization. Yeah, maybe. well, when I started, I couldn't tell you what was going on in each of those schools. Yeah. I wouldn't care to guess or ascribe uh, anything to their, their behaviors of the staff. But I, I think it was quite provincial. Um, I know an awful lot of planning of the schools of education, graduate schools of education, was not very innovative, mm -hmm. and it was as static as the high school classes were. So when I had to take administration classes in uh, my early in my career, because I wanted to get promoted, uh, I had to have certificates. The classes were as brutally boring <laughs> as my high school classes. <laughs> And there was just no such thing as stimulation or encouraging people to think. You mm -hmm. know, just uh, a regimen had been established decades ago, generations ago, and you, you maintain the, the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were all racially segregated because Boston was such a unique geographical city. We're, we're different from all the other cities, especially western and midwestern cities. We never had any room. So when the people got here, they, I was telling you, Jared, a little earlier, when they got off the boat, they stayed where they were. Um, this was predominantly Irish. Uh, first and second generation, mostly second generation. Everybody I knew was se second generation Irish. Uh, but I don't think, there, there weren't other races. Um, there was historically a black middle class tradition in Boston. Uh, people who have been here, as telling Jared, a lot longer than the Irish people. And like the Irish people, whether they knew it or not, they were Anglophiles. The, the British certainly impress, uh, oppressed most of the world, and uh, the Irish certainly for a thousand years suffered horrible brutality, and the black people in the Golden Triangle <laughs> certainly uh, had an awful experience getting here, but when the Irish and the, the um, African people got here, they soon adopted all the values of the British. Uh, and, you know, it's hard for me to believe that there were positive values among the British people, but there were, you know, there was a gentility. Uh, the early black people that I met at high school had this gentility about them. They all dressed in the British fashion. Uh, the houses looked, uh, lace curtains and draperies and carpets and kitchens and family. Uh, the, the, the black kids I first knew in high school uh, came from families that uh, were intact. Now, uh, on a lot of different races, there are not intact families. There's no family suppers and things like that. I can remember the, later in my life, taking kids on field trips, uh, exchange programs to Canada and different places like that. And the high schools I was in were, had no white kids in those days uh, after desegregation. And um, the black kids were amazed that the kids would sit around, the host houses would sit around the table mm -hmm and discussed it, the, the father would ask, like one young girl said, mister, do you know, we have to sit at the table every night, and, he, and the father asks us how our day was, and the kids tell him, <laughs> you know. So the, there was absolute racial and national segregation and residential patterns in Boston, but it wasn't willful, you know, no race selected that. My family wanted to get out of Charlestown. Uh, they heard that, you know, this was like a suburb out here. 
They wanted a yard, they wanted anything, and uh, they didn't come because they were running away from the Italian family that moved in down the street, or the post-war, the, the DPs, the displaced persons, the, we called them, coming from uh, the Baltic states mm -hmm. and uh, Eastern Europe. There was just nobody thought of that. You know? None of that stuff occurred to us. Uh, Garrett? A Garrity? Yes, you know, I'm a little self conscious being a, a teacher. A, a, a teacher is supposed to be the one doing the least amount of talking in the class. <laughs> I feel like I'm one of those guys I had in high school. I'm, I'm, I'm giving a narration, and you guys better listen. Uh, so maybe I'll challenge you to give me some notes afterwards. And maybe, maybe a pop quiz or some inane thing like that. Uh, well, we were talking a little bit earlier. Boston schools were not good for anybody when I started out in the, in the 60s. And the demography of the city was changing dramatically. I can't give you the details. They're probably easily found. But the welfare system in Massachusetts Suddenly, there was a difference between welfare city and the state, and the mm -hmm. state took over. And all of a sudden, in the 60s, uh, we had a huge immigration of black people, primarily from the Carolinas and East Coast. If you went to Chicago these days, you'd probably find the trace of the roots of uh, people who were deeply from uh, Alabama and Mississippi and places like that, they shot up through the, went in a linear pattern north. Uh, so the same thing here. We had a very large Jewish population in parts of Roxbury and Mattapan. There's a belt, if anybody knows, going down Blue Hill Avenue mm -hmm. and on, on both sides of Blue Hill Avenue. And of course, a lot of those people who did not live in apartment houses were Jewish people who lived in beautiful um, colonial houses. I'm not talking about affluent Jewish people, just the beautiful, well-structured houses. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't new money. They were working as hard as everybody else. And the Jewish people began to move out, and it left a lot of residential areas. And that left a lot of schools that had 30, 35 kids in a class and suddenly became empty. And there was room for black kids to go to school and new migration filled the void. <coughs> uh, so when I was at what I called the planning center, my second job after T, we were recruited to start planning. And a lot of people were beginning to complain, rightfully so, that the buildings were decrepit. They complained about the classroom. They complained about the instruction. Uh, I really can't comment about what the elementary schools were doing for instruction because that wasn't my experience. Mm -hmm. So a planning center was established. Central administration was static, just as the city was static. And you continued doing what you were doing because you had done it. We, we, we always did that. You know, the Shirley Jackson story where they had the lottery and they stoned somebody every yes, year. Yes. And the simple reason we did it, because we always we did do it. it. Yep. Um, and we try to encourage building new schools. And we were able to get uh, 29 buildings put up in, in, in 42 months. And we took groups of people in those neighborhoods and in their living rooms and kitchens and planned for what they wanted in their schools. Of course, the concept in those days was neighborhood schools. 
But now the racial imbalance law that the state passed in 66 and the Civil Rights Commission in the late 60s were making desegregation an issue people are aware of. And it, you know, so I think we were probably one of the first cities to do magnet schools. Uh, I don't know if that term is still around these days, but our idea was let's get these new schools to replace the old schools, get kids in better environments, and <coughs> draw white people from one neighborhood where they had terrible schools and black people for another, mm -hmm. and put the school in a building in a location that could not be called a black neighborhood or a white neighborhood. Uh, but unfortunately, there were no rules in the city about who would go to school where. Mm. You, you just walk up through a door and you go in and you, you, you go. But overcrowding now became an issue. I don't think the city ever reacted to classes that were, to had the fact that schools had schools, classrooms that were packed. 36, you know, I had 42 kids in a class that was designed for 20. And um, you just accepted it. <laughs> you, yeah. you didn't think much about it. So uh, a lot of publicity came about. A lot of people were saying that there were words we had never heard before, like inequity and this administration was just not equipped to understand what are you talking about inequity you know we're nice people we're fair people they they, they really didn't get it mm -hmm. so uh the schools became more and more overcrowded in 1966 I know in 1978, when I became uh, in involved in the administration of the desegregation plan, we had 112,000 kids in the city. I think I read the other day there's 49,000. Uh, I was we had 204 schools. Uh, I, I can't even imagine how few the number had. I know one of the things we tried to do was close many of those schools and relocate their kids. But bad p patterns in s schools were occurring. When a school was getting too black, say Dorchester High School uh, uh, in particular, uh, the next school over high school was South Boston High. The school department, I don't think, really considered what they were doing. They kept adding inadequate annexes to South Boston High. And its best day, I think South Boston High probably had 1,250 kids uh, capacity. Maybe the enrollment was 900 or 1,000. But they put in um, these annexes and went up over 20, maybe as high as 2,500 kids. And they were white kids that they were bringing in. English High School was kind of a landmark school in Boston. It's the oldest high school in America. Boston Latin's the oldest school in America, but this was the first high school. And that was probably pretty well racially integrated in the 60s. Before. But terrible administrative blunder, a school like that, <clears throat> With the overcrowding in, in, uh, in, in the middle schools, or they were junior highs in those days, they assigned 10 or 11 new feeder schools. The kids when they, who finished at these junior high schools would be assigned automatically to English high. And of the 10 or 11 feeder schools, they assigned probably, I think, all but two, one in the north end, and one in um, Edward Everett Square, the area of Dorchester, 
were assigned to uh, English A. So all of a sudden, a, a vibrant high school, my brother went there, English high school became um, black and balanced. And now we're hearing social issues on the news every night of, uh, about segregation and inequity and inequality and those kinds of things. And that's fostering resentment. So people in the state are saying we're going to have an imbalanced plan and people in the city are digging their heels in and they're the politicians. So they know as long as they can take racial sides that they're going to stay in office. And I think I told Jared a little earlier that there were 11,000 jobs in, in the school department plus part-time jobs. Only 6,000 were teachers. And five elected officials could have great influence in controlling those jobs, getting people there. So the political issue was getting out of hand. And um, the social unrest w was, was getting excessive coverage. And of course, uh, m the media makes the news. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> at the planning center, I had a team, and we would uh, try to modernize the administrator, how we were assigning kids to school. Charlestown High was following the same pattern as South Boston High. Charlestown High was bringing in kids from, white kids from as far as West Roxbury. <laughs> what a commute in traffic mm. <coughs> to go there because they didn't have a school to go. Um, we said the worst thing that can happen to a, to a city and to a court is to require a court to tell you what to do. If you look throughout history at all the desegregation, hundreds of desegregation cases in the South, the courts all avoided becoming educational administrators. Garrity did not want to administer school systems. And um, as long as the politicians defied a any attempts of change, they were enhancing their personal s situation, perhaps their assets. And uh, there was another factor about their assets. These elected officials used to have faculty members in almost every building sell tickets to a concept that was called a time. Each school committee member could have a time. And a time, maybe you could have two a year, and they would rotate when they were. So this month we have a time for so-and-so, and you go collect tickets, uh, $25 a head. When I first got into as a school teacher, I was recruited, I had to pay $25 a head for a politician's time. It would be, maybe you could all get together and shake hands and carry signs in a place like the aquarium or a hotel. And you know, $25 a, a ticket, is, that's about $250, $230 today. Uh, that was cash. Uh, I think there's now laws against uh, that type of thing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, if I were contributing to a time and I had an uncle who drank himself out of his job at the construction company someplace, uh, I could call the school committee member and i say, you know, they have a night school here at the e Edison for the people who want to learn auto mechanics or carpentry skills or, you know, not certifiable skills, mm -hmm. it's lessons. Uh, can you put him on as the, as the supervisor? You know, if you had paid enough tickets for times, you probably would get that job. Uh, so can you imagine a... Uh, I think my first job was $4,200 a year. If I had to pay <coughs> five school committee members 10 times a year <laughs> to 25 bucks, <laughs> it, it, it was a hit. 
So it was a hard job not, not to do. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if they knew, they would go around election day and see who was holding their signs, all the different precincts throughout the city. And so the, we designed plans for identifying who our students were, where they lived, <coughs> who their siblings were, what kind of programs they needed. And uh, concomitantly in these days, there was a huge suit going on for years by the state against the city because they were not providing services for special education. Chapter 766, mm. they used to call that. Uh, kids who needed what special education were just thousands and thousands. Uh, when I was at English High School uh, as a teacher years later, there was 72% uh, of our kids had never been graduated from any elementary or junior high school or middle school. They were coming in with terrible previous backgrounds, and of course, so many of them spoke different. We had 86 different languages. And um, <clears throat> we tried to convince the, the administration that we should be making an effort to head off the impending doom of external administration. Uh, I guess they call the word, they have a word now called receivership. Mm -hmm. So we developed statistical data systems for identifying our children, what was available in schools. We, this was the early days of computer. We computerized what our school facilities looked like and what our student body looked like and where they were. And we drew up series of plans. We would have big maps, uh, huge uh, maps, color-coded, you know, not sophisticated stuff because we didn't have <laughs> the techniques that we have today. And show on a new school where the population was suggested to come from and then try to recruit those people. We also had staff members of different races here. This was entirely different. And we had women administrators. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> people, we could go into homes and neighborhoods and churches and uh, restaurant basements and build up communities that felt invested. And, um, you know, people felt comfortable making decisions. Do you want to paint the interior concrete walls or do you want to have a swimming pool? You know, however many dollars, one million dollars, one was going to be, you know, take a pick. Do you want a planetarium? Uh, do you want a certain kind of gymnasium? We have a budget. The state was paying 90% of school buildings in those days. Uh, and so people were actively following. Well, of course, I, I never heard that name. I was, I was fearful that the federal interventionists, because the, the Civil Rights Commission had mm -hmm. been uh, investigating but this all was preceding the Garrity. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, we're still in the 60s. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, okay, so I guess I get my cue. <laughs> Let me move, move a little well, faster. I, I had a quick qu question before you move on to busing. Who were you presenting that data to that you collected? Well, first of all, we were presenting it to administration. As in the, uh, the uh, Kevin White administration? No, or? the school department school administration. School department administration, yeah. okay. Yeah, Kevin White did exist in the 60s. Uh, yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. We talked a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I guess, we, I guess let's I, get, skip I, get, ahead. I get it moving along. Let's skip ahead to 74, 1974. Yeah. All right. Well, 74 began in 72 when they said, All right, the, the school system is intransigent, the school committee is intransigent. They're not going to make any concessions. They deny everything. Um, <clears throat> they, they've drawn their line in the sand. So a suit came to court, and um, the uh, uh, 
Morgan versus Hennigan, I guess is the name of the suit. Uh, and uh, it was sponsored by uh, different organizations. The Harvard School of Education, I, I, I believe, had a big part in the suit. And it went to court. And so even when it was in court in 72 and 73, I was still trying to convince the, <coughs> the school department to look to see if we could show something. We're trying to do something to represent the people that are sitting in the audience. I, I had press in the office every, every day. Uh, a lot of people went on to become famous national newscasters to this day. Leslie Stahl, one of, you know, oh, people, really? people like that, Steve Shepard, who had years of uh, CBS television, mm -hmm. uh, all of those names. So if we finally, and I think in about 72, we were able to get an assembly at school department headquarters, the school committee acquiesced that they would listen to some of our plans. And we set up massive charts all around the room in different locations, F filled the room, of course it wasn't too big, and um, all the press was there, the Klieg lights, I guess they used to call them, were there. And as uh, a couple of my colleagues, we went to the, the charts and the chairman of the school committee pulled the cord. Uh, this is not going to be seen. Yeah. Of course, I knew all this, uh, these press people, television, radio, newspapers uh, over the years because they had been interviewing us so much. And I said, is this, uh, is this a story for tonight? Not a word was said. Never uh, that the city cannot hear alternative suggestions. Yeah. And it went to court. And uh, the, the decision came down in June of, May or June of 74. And <clears throat> of course the decision was brutal, harsh. And uh, what the implementation requirements were The first uh, two parts of the city to be changed were South Boston and Charlestown. Yep. I can't imagine there were, I ever met many people who wanted their children going to school someplace they had never been. The parents had never been, the children had never been a distance. The plans were devised by two masters the, the court had hired at $200 a day for the more senior master and $100 a day for the junior master. And the one came from the, uh, the, the, one of the Carolinas, I believe, the other came from Kansas. Uh, Kansas won the, the lead, was a sociologist who believed in sociological experimentation. I told uh, Jared earlier, he was, um, he told me one time that he was a triage officer. We were going to have survivors and we we're going to have sufferers. And to make this work, that's the way it had to be. And whoever advised them had no knowledge of all the data that we had acquired and, and where our children lived. <coughs> and what kinds of programs we would have. They just took the racial codes and the racial statistics and signed them to meet quotas they set. Of course, they couldn't possibly meet the quotas. Mm -hmm. The quotas they were, we, you know, it, society was changing too much. The population was changing. The old people were dying. Uh, <laughs> young, young people were taking jobs. Mm -hmm. there, there was a big turnover. In 1950, we had a city of 844,000 people. In 1980, we had a city of 560,000. You can't lose 33% of your city that fast. You know, and th these people are going. 
course, they had automobiles and malls and things now. They were drawing the white people out of the city mm -hmm. even before anybody heard anything about race. And um, the judges required the school system to have an office of implementation of his plan. I testified before the judge several times. Um, I always found him to be an avuncular type. He was a courtly man. Uh, he did not seem to be a crusader. He did not seem to uh, have um, his personal need to promote himself. His court was always running a fair system. But he was ill-advised. He just wasn't getting anything from his sociologist. Mm -hmm. And n nobody knew anything about the traffic patterns and morning traffic and, and the roads. And, you know, Boston's a city of infill and annexation. All the parts of Boston, Brighton, where we're sitting, was annexed in the eight, 1800s, 1870s. Yeah. Roxbury, Mattapan, all these places came in in the, in the late 1800s. After they, so they had all different kinds of topographical concerns for modern traffic. <clears throat> in Kansas, the towns were much newer. Throughout the Midwest, all the, the streets are on grid patterns, 90 degree angles. Um, <clears throat> they had room to spread out. I have grandchildren in Illinois. You know, <laughs> you can move buses around in those kinds of places. You can't move buses down American Legion Highway and Columbia Road mm -hmm. <laughs> on a school morning. Well, you didn't think about that. I don't, you know, that's the first time that <laughs> you ever brought, brought that up. Uh, well, you knew that I was a hated person by the administration, by the school committee, very hated. But that was just like somebody trash talking you when you're in a, playing football in high school. You know, you didn't, it didn't register. Yeah. And, you know, we all grew up in neighborhoods where there was fighting all the time. Mm -hmm. So that was just uh, the mentality. Uh, but the black people, how long have they been ignored, too, you know? So maybe if I should have been, I, I, I wasn't bright enough to be upset about being ignored. But, you know, they were beginning to be upset about being ignored. Uh, they didn't realize they were ignored now because they were fodder. Yeah. And um, School committee, though, after the Garrity decision was handed down, to what extent did they have any... Did they retain their power and influence because they were? Well, I think they lost the access to the the jobs, yeah, the, the, the contributions. Mm -hmm. But um, they didn't. Uh, they tried very hard when I was an administrator to uh, intervene in personal level to get certain assignments for 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 students, favoritism, mm -hmm. all the politics, city mm -hmm. council, everybody. But before we get to there, I know I've been too slow here. Um, when the Office of Implementation was established, it, it, it was crazy sending kids from bad schools to other bad schools just because of their melanin or lack of melanin. Uh, putting them on buses at places that people were afraid of. Uh, you know, this was a very tame residential area out here, but if I were a black person in uh, what we call Dudley Station in those days, mm -hmm. I'd never want to send my kid out to the far ends of Brighton, you know, have to travel through Brookline, mm -hmm. another town, to get here. Uh, you know, it's just too far, too, too long. It didn't, didn't make sense. I want my kid <laughs> to, to go to that little school we always would to. And... Uh, they were sending handicapped kids out of their handicapped classrooms. They were sending, I was teaching for a while at Latin school and had uh, kids who were assigned to vocational programs at a trade school for their senior years. And, you know, it, it, it was just woeful. So the planning center, uh, we, get, we all left the planning center because it was starting to be corrupt. The school committee was assigning incompetent, lazy people, white people, 
to jobs at the planning center that they had no interest in doing. Mm -hmm. It was like getting a job in the T today. Uh, you know, they just did not want to show up. And uh, so we disbanded. And we get back together again in 74 when we saw that the implementation of the court order was worse than the court order. I don't think Garrity realized um, because he got all his hard data, what he considered hard data from his masters. He didn't realize that there were thousands of kids who had no assignments, that had no place to go to school in September and, uh, of 74. And then um, people who, the, the white people were just fleeing. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this day, I know so many black and white people who, who were subjected to t terrible or, or, or ordeals. And uh, we petitioned the court to establish a new department. And uh, we had hearings and hearings uh, for a whole year. And uh, I think a year or two, no, it took us three years. And now there's violence in the schools, there's snipers on the, on the uh, rooftops, there's uh, we're driving through the streets. It was just an extraordinary experience. All I could think of is all the early newsreels on television of student unrest in Korea and the Philippines that we would see nightly. Now Asian film crews were in our streets filming our violence. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, a remarkable feeling. Well, we finally prevailed to establish a department of implementation. They came up with the court said that's who call it, and he let all new administration. Oh, geez. <laughs> and we took over, and we said we could get everybody in a reasonable seat and a reasonable assignment, but we couldn't assure they'd go. Mm -hmm. And there would be no interference in who had favoritism and how they get there. And <clears throat> um, we said we could do this in 18 months. I think we got all the police and uh, the armed police and mm -hmm. the s uh, special forces out of the schools in nine months. Yeah. So, uh, so but it never worked. But it never worked. And so that is the core of your experience, you think, is that the attempts to address this problem of, of racial imbalance and, and de facto segregation in Boston public schools, it was far too little too late. Well, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I don't have the confidence that our plans would have worked. And yeah. I just felt that, that you, you, you're putting in... You were putting in Football plays to a, a lacrosse or soccer team. Uh, yeah. Uh, it just w wasn't going to line up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, it, it, you know, whoever you talk to, I know it, it, it seemed to have successes in many towns in the South. And uh, the politics got so volatile mm -hmm. that it, it's, I guess it's, if you ever sat in a probate court, it gets so volatile yeah. that it's not resolvable. Exactly. And, and that's, that seems to have been the, the, the core of, of this period of history in Boston, you know? Yes. Is that it wasn't yeah. resolvable. But yeah, there were certainly no winners. I can't imagine that any, yeah. anybody who felt success or felt benefit or felt his opportunity or her opportunity had been enhanced. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, John, for, for sharing the story with us. It's, it's really so, so fascinating yeah. and insightful. Yeah. 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 I hate to tell you, I've never talked so much after it's years and years in the classroom. <laughs> and I don't think I got anywhere. I, you know, I just probably spent too much time on... Uh, some issues and no, no, no. Uh, so I feel disappointed in my contribution but um, no not at all yeah it, it, it certainly went on there was uh, 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 how we got the the new 
offices established and who we had working now in administration and the results, you know, to me was qu quite interesting. Uh, it, uh, uh, it was entirely different staff than mm -hmm. had ever been assembled in, in, in the school department in Pauline Center. Uh, 